Welcome to Love and Abuse, the show about helping you identify poisonous communication and toxic behavior. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. That's why it's important that you learn to pinpoint manipulative and controlling behavior so that you keep your power and your sanity. I'm your host, Paul Coliani. Welcome to another episode of Love and Abuse. If you're a first-time listener, you are absolutely welcome here. And if you are a long-time listener, it is great to have you back. We talk about all kinds of things on this show, but they really come down to manipulation, emotional abuse, control, uh, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, and all of the bad behaviors that we really don't want in our lives and uh, a lot of people can do to us in our lives. Anyone from friends, family, and especially romantic partners. This is the majority of what I hear from people is their romantic partners. And of course, sometimes mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and other people that are in the family. I've already mentioned family, but those specific people, sometimes uh, they stand out. (laughs) Sometimes the more prominent people in your significant other's family will stand out and sometimes cause problems. But anyone is capable of this. We are all capable of all the behavior that I talk about, and some of us more than others. Some of us are certifiable. (laughs) Maybe not you, maybe not me, but some of us are diagnosable, certifiable, uh, capable of doing behaviors and not stopping. I mean, sometimes we figure out we're doing a behavior and we want to stop. And this is something that I would hope that anyone listening to the show would want to do in their lives. They figure out a behavior that they're doing that turns out to be something that is not very healthy and more along the lines of toxic. And they realize they should probably stop not only for the other people, but for them. You know, during my entire life, When I was dealing with my own emotionally abusive ways, I carried around emotional triggers that when they activated, I became a jerk. I was sneaky. I was coercive. I was manipulative. I was judgmental. I was controlling, but in a very subtle way, a very covert way. Um, I had a lot of tendencies of covert narcissism and I didn't know I was doing it. I just thought, this is what you're supposed to do. That sounds silly. It sounds like an excuse. But I look back at myself from this more healed place, this healthier place that I'm in today, and I can look back and see those behaviors and freely and with all transparency admit that's what I was doing and that's who I was. And I think that's important to do when you discover something about yourself and you go through a healing process. And it's also a good indicator that when someone has healed, they can look back and say, yeah, that's who I was. So this is for anyone, not just me. This is for anyone listening or anyone in your life. When they have healed from something that they did that hurt others, you know, we're talking about emotional abuse, manipulation, control. When they healed, they can look back and say, yeah, I was a real jerk back then. I think that's a very healthy perspective to put yourself down (laughs) only back then, only after you've healed. It's not healthy to do it today. So let me just make that clear. But I look back at my past and I can put myself down because, damn it, I was a jerk back then. Those people didn't deserve me. Those women that I loved in an unhealthy way didn't deserve that behavior. I can't think of anyone in my life that ever deserved the behavior that I was doing around them or doing toward them. They didn't deserve it. And I now can say that feeling bad that I did it because I do, but because I have healed and I have actually been in touch with uh, one or two of those women and we have reconnected in a healthier way where I'm in this new space. And of course I have a new relationship, so it's not rekindling anything, but it's reconnecting in a healthier way to let them know that I am not that person anymore. Not that I'm 
trying to convince them, but just showing up as a healthier me. And there's a distinct difference there. There's a difference between showing up in someone's life as the person that you used to be who may not have gone through the healing that you needed or all of it and trying to convince them that you went through healing. There's that person. And then there's the other person who has healed, realizes who they were, and realizes that if that person never wants to talk to me again, I totally get it. And I get that. There are people in my life that probably don't want to talk to me again. And I totally get it. I get it. Why would they? If all they knew was that person that I was back then, of course they're not going to want to talk to me again. And I'm not going to try to reach out and say, hey, I'm not that person anymore. That will be something that if they really need to pursue that, they can. But just like if you are the victim of any type of emotional abuse and you've gotten out of that relationship, that it's probably best that you moved on and wish the person that you were with the best in the sense that you don't have to say it out loud, but in your own mind, you can say, I wish you the best. I hope you find healing. I hope you can find solace in your chaotic mind. That's where my mind was. It was chaotic. It was always on alert. I had to watch her behavior all the time. I had to observe it and make sure that she was doing things the right way. It was that micromanager that I was making sure that she was doing all the right things to make us happy and healthy and make the relationship better. And of course, I'm describing some of my emotionally abusive behavior back then because I was watching her. I was keeping tabs. I was counting all the times she did things that uh, hurt me, even though they weren't really things that hurt me at all. I just took it that way. I interpreted things that way. And you know, I've talked about that in other episodes, so I don't want to get into that now, but I share this with you because it's important to understand that the person you are after you heal from something like this, whether you're the victim or the perpetrator, is a different person. You're going to feel different. It's going to be a relief from who you were. If you were the victim, you're going to be so relieved that you're not that person that gets victimized by those people. Not that it's your fault. Not that there's something wrong with you or there's something broken. It's just that you get to a point where you draw the line and you say never again. I will never take that behavior ever again. When you get into that space, you are a different person. And the perpetrator of abuse, they get to that same space. That's where I got. After my divorce, I promised myself that I would never behave that way again. I don't care if they broke all my former rules and all my former standards. If my partner or anyone in my life did something that I disagreed with, that I was no longer going to focus on them wanting them to change and wanting to control them and micromanage them. I was going to take that out of the equation. That was my promise to myself. And my follow-up promise to that was, if I see something happening that used to trigger me or is triggering me now, then I'm going to focus on myself. I'm going to focus on what I am judging, what I want to control, and why I want to do that, why it's so important to me, why I want to change the person I'm with. I want to focus on all of these things in myself and figure out why can't I just be accepting? Why can't I just be more unconditionally loving? I may not be able to reach that ever, you know, full unconditional love. I don't know if any of us can, but why can't I at least take a step toward being more unconditionally loving and take a step away from being controlling and manipulative and just a jerk? Why can't I take a step away from that and toward the loving person that I want to be? And so that was another promise I made to myself. I wanted to be a better person. And I believe this is what we all want. I think we all want to be a better person. And some of us define better and 
different ways. So we have to be really careful how we define better in ourselves. If your definition of better is, I don't want to attract jerks, you might need to refine it and adjust that a little bit. Because you may get to a point where you're no longer attracting jerks, but what are you attracting? Okay, I'm no longer attracting jerks, but now I'm attracting uh, greedy people. Not a jerk to me, but he or she's so greedy. You know, something like that. So I like to maybe define it a little bit further than that. This is kind of what you do when you're writing out your wants in a relationship. You know, I have a, a really simple three-column chart in the Mean Workbook that says what I don't want. And the second column is what I do want I mean, in a partner. This is really about a romantic relationship, but you can do this in other relationships too. What I don't want, what I do want, and what would be nice. And when you fill this out, you start defining the boundaries of your next relationship and also defining what you value in your next relationship or your current relationship. I mean, this doesn't have to be for the next relationship. This can be for the relationship that you're in now. You can say, what don't I want? Or what would I rather not exist in the relationship? What do I want? And what would be nice? You know, the would be nice column could be, I want them to be an intelligent supermodel with a hot body uh, who's rich. <laughs> that may not be everybody's desire. I'm just putting that out there because sometimes we have these fantasies that we think, oh, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice if that was the case. And some people, they don't reach to the stars like that and look for that perfect person who ends up on a cover of a magazine. Sometimes we just want something better than we had. And that can be nice too. But I wouldn't just stop at, this is what I don't want. This is one of those things where I don't want to uh, attract jerks anymore. Okay, you don't want that, but what do you want? Well, I want this. And then you start defining that in your life so that you have something to compare it to. So when somebody comes along and they are or are not that, you'll know if you're going to be compatible with them or if you're going to like them, let alone love them. But you get that structure, that foundation of what you do and what you don't want and what would be nice so that you understand your own wants and needs better. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm actually here to talk about this email that I received to help us analyze a situation, a relationship situation that has occurred for this person for several years. And this person wanted to figure out how the conversations kept going south and how they kept going in a bad direction. So I'm just going to read this email and I may make comments throughout and uh, we'll see where we get. But he writes, um, I admitted to being the abusive one in my relationship, but the more I listen to your show, the more I'm starting to realize that, in fact, I have been the victim, not the abuser. My partner always had a problem with me eventually losing my temper and raising my voice when we had a fight or a disagreement about something. But after consensually making voice notes of our arguments, meaning recordings, and listening back to them, I've picked up on something that I've never picked up on before. Every time we had a fight that has descended into me raising my voice, swearing, and sometimes name-calling, which I fully accept as being verbally abusive and recognize that I need to work through, it has always followed this sequence of events. So he's about to describe what this sequence of events is. And uh, this is something that, I'm going to comment on this right now, this is something that if you have a partner or someone else in your life that wants to work through the challenging conversation and figure out how it keeps going wrong, that if you both agree to record it and listen to it later and break it down and try to figure out where it goes wrong, it can be very helpful. It can also drum up some old emotional triggers from the argument, but it can be very helpful. And maybe you can listen to it separately and figure out exactly when the problem starts or where it really goes bad. But this is what he did. I'm going to continue reading it as we go because it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating that he actually did this and he had consent from his partner doing this. So he said, um, I would express something that she said or did that hurt my feelings. So he would express, hey, you know, what you said or did hurt my feelings. 
in his own way. He'd say that. She would then say that what she said or did shouldn't hurt my feelings or that I'm just being too overly sensitive about it or it's not a big deal and so on. So we already see one thing happening here. It's the invalidation. He didn't, I don't think he said invalidation in this email, but this is definitely invalidation and dismissive and uh, showing that his words, his expressions, his feelings simply aren't important to her. I mean, this is how he's interpreting it. She may really think his feelings are important, but her words to him that he shouldn't be hurt is a complete invalidation. It's like saying, it doesn't matter how you feel. That's basically what he hears in that moment. It doesn't matter how you feel. This is what's important. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this fact. So we're already glossing over something that is super vital in this conversation. And he's noticing it. He's finally getting this from the recording. So I'm going to move on and we'll talk about it some more. Her first step was to deny me my feelings and make me question whether I should be feeling these things or not. All right, so he goes on, but before he does, I'm going to say this. When somebody makes you question whether you should be feeling something or not, that is not healthy. That is a toxic way to divert the conversation into a better outcome for the person that's doing that to you. In this case, he says her first step was to deny me my feelings and make me question whether I should be feeling these things or not. I want you to get used to saying this following statement. And it's this, my feelings are valid and they matter. That's it. My feelings are valid and they matter. Now that doesn't mean you have to say it to that person, but it may be helpful to do that. But the reason I want you to ingrain that, to, to really burn it into your brain is because when you are told that your feelings don't matter or you shouldn't feel that way. That's typically how it goes. You shouldn't feel that way. That's not what I meant. You're just too sensitive. When you hear that, you repeat to yourself, my feelings are valid and they matter. That's what you do. So when somebody tells you that your feelings don't matter or they're not important or your feelings are wrong in this case, your feelings are valid. They're inside you. They're happening. There's no denying it. You cannot deny what you're feeling. It doesn't matter if they're valid to the context of what's happening. You're still having the feeling. And any thoughts that come up, any of the emotions, all of the physical sensations, they're all valid. So when someone says you're being overly sensitive or you shouldn't feel that way, it doesn't matter. Your feelings are still valid. They're still real. They're still happening. So you need to own that. You need to own that inside you, that what you're experiencing is reality. You don't need anyone else twisting your reality. So yes, it can come out in the conversation if they say, oh, you shouldn't feel that. You can say, no, it's not a matter of should or shouldn't. It just is. This is how I feel. Whether you think I should feel this way or not isn't the issue. The issue is I feel this way. It's a fact. It's reality. Reality can't be denied. This is how I feel. It'd be like someone getting a cut on their hand and you looking at them saying, you shouldn't be cut. You shouldn't have that wound on your hand. You shouldn't. You're just overly sensitive to that knife. You shouldn't have that cut. They're going to be confused. I want you to be confused in this case. I rarely want you to be confused. You don't want to be confused typically. It happens. But I want you to be confused when they say you shouldn't feel something because your confusion will come from a place of, but I do. I do feel something. So it's reality. So I'm not sure what you're saying. Yeah, you can say that I shouldn't feel that way, but I do. So it's really a non-issue. Just like the person with the cut, you can say that I shouldn't be cut, but I am. I'm cut. There's really nothing more to say about that. It's an open wound. It's on my hand. It's bleeding. And it's reality. So... Let's just accept that and move on to the next subject. This might not go well. I'm not saying this is going to turn into a much better conversation, but I do want you to have that, uh, that feeling of self-validation, knowing that your feelings are real and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, that what you're experiencing is reality. So I'm going to move on to the next thing he says. I just want to get that out of the way. 
Continuing from what he just said, her first step was to deny me the feelings and make me question whether I should be feeling these things or not, which we just talked about. We would then continue down a completely misguided path, focusing on the things that she did or said that caused my hurt feelings, rather than the fact that she was dismissing my feelings. Okay, so this kind of confirms what I just said about the invalidation, is that instead of going back to those feelings and saying, oh no, those are real, these feelings are happening, so I just want to let you know that this is what I feel. You can have a conversation about that. You absolutely can and probably should because at that moment, there's an opportunity to connect and there's an opportunity to, again, validate and there's an opportunity to explore this together and figure out how we got there and how we can get out of it. And what I said that brought you to the point where you felt that way, there's all kinds of things to talk about there. So what he's noticing from this recording is that as soon as I expressed my feelings, it was invalidated and moved on to the next thing. And when that happens, what happens inside you? I mean, practice this for a second. What happens when you come to me, let's just say that I'm coaching you and you say, Paul, I feel really sad when this person says this to me. I feel really sad that it happens and I don't know what to do about it. And if I said, well, you shouldn't feel sad. Don't worry about that. You shouldn't feel sad, but let's talk about this instead. What happens inside you when I say that? You shouldn't feel sad. Just Let's just talk about the next thing. It feels like I'm letting you linger out there. I mean, this is what happens to me when I try it on. I feel like I'm just lingering out there. Like, okay, uh, I'm not sure what to do now because I just expressed something that was true to me, so now I'm having this cognitive dissonance and I don't know where to go with this. I feel like I'm in this voidy state and I can't even express what I'm expressing. And if I can't tell you what I'm feeling because it's not valid or not worth talking about, then how am I going to get to the next place with you because you just lost me? That's where I go with this when I try it on myself. If somebody invalidates your feelings, you're going to be lost. You're going to feel like, well, I can't even get to the next step with this conversation because we haven't even talked about what I just mentioned. So once you're in that first place where you feel lost, it can go downhill from there because you don't have any stable footing anymore. The foundation's gone. And if you can't even have a solid base to land on, you may not be able to get through the rest of the conversation or argument. This is what can happen and what does happen a lot. As soon as that foundation is jostled enough so that it's too shaky to stand on and even told that it's not even real or worth talking about, then you have no starting point. Your starting point has been taken away and suddenly you are in this empty space. You're just lingering. And this is why things can go south pretty quickly. And as you talk about things further, since the first feeling was invalidated, you have no stepping stones to get to the next place that you need to get to, which might be the conversation that ensues after the invalidation so that you can actually get somewhere in the conversation. This can go all kinds of wrong after you've been left lingering like that. So let me continue. We were usually always both at fault because she was unaware that the real issue was that she was dismissing my feelings and making me question myself. My fault was that I was never able to communicate it properly because as soon as I would say something and get her defensive response, I would find it very difficult to go deeper into why I was feeling that way. Again, this kind of confirms exactly what I just said, is that once you're left lingering, you have no solid base to stand on to form any coherent sentences, really. You feel like, well, I didn't get that first point across, and now I feel like I'm talking to a salesman who's trying to talk me into paying a lot of money and buying the extended warranty. I feel like I really can't keep up, and I'm nervous about signing the contract. This is kind of where I go. It may not be the best analogy for you, but once you're past that first invalidation, then the rest of it is very hard to be on board with and have a legitimate conversation because the first part of it wasn't solidified. And this is exactly what he's saying, or at least this is how I interpret it, is that he said he was never able to communicate it properly because as soon as he said something and got her defensive response, now he's dealing with her defensiveness. 
now he is probably having an emotionally triggered reaction inside of him. Her defensiveness kicks in his defensiveness, and now it's an entirely different heated conversation. And when your fear and defensiveness takes over, you're in fight or flight, you're in survival mode, and now you're just in this other space. And now you're getting farther and farther away from what's really important. And um, that could be, we need to talk about our feelings. We need to talk about how this hurt me and how I hurt you. Let's talk about that stuff. But now we're defending ourselves from immediate danger. And when we do that, our blood pressure goes up. Our stress level goes up. We're not thinking clearly. We're very myopically focused on what's in front of us and how to avoid this danger. And what do we do next? It's just a very different mindset. So let me continue. He said, she would drag things up from the past and say things like, you shout at me, which is much worse, or something similar like that. He said, I would feel wronged and I would need an apology, but without fully understanding why. I just needed her to acknowledge what she had done and to address it, but she never would. She always believed that I was just too sensitive and that I shouldn't have felt the way I did. The communication tools that we both have are broken, but I've made a conscious and determined effort to fix them by reading a book and dissecting our past arguments, and I thought that I had solved our relationship problems. I thought the problem was communication, so I worked really hard to improve my tool set. I suggested that she read the book that I had read, but she didn't, as she saw and still sees the main problem being the fact that I lose my temper eventually. She told me a few months ago that I'm an abusive person and I couldn't accept that I was. I didn't want to be an abuser and for her to tell me that I had been for all these years broke my heart and I couldn't accept it. Our final fight was this year and she moved out. I suggested that we have a breakup and work on our issues and I've been obsessing over the fact that she has told me a few times that I'm abusive. I accepted this as 100% truth but as I said, I'm starting to question this after listening back in detail to those voice recordings of our arguments and listening to your podcast. I love this woman to pieces and I want nothing more for her to address her tendency to dismiss and deny my feelings so that we can have a healthy relationship together. I had so much hope that we could work things out based on the fact that I had accepted her and I've been abusive, but now after realizing that I'm fitting in with the victim side, I'm starting to lose hope. We're on our break now, but I'm really struggling with this because I miss her so much. She also mentioned that she couldn't really put a time limit on our break because she has to stand up for herself. But she has recognized all the work that I put in and has said that she's not sure if she does want this break to be forever. I just want to thank you for making the podcast. It's been absolutely intrinsic in getting me through the darkest time of my life. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for writing all of that. And thank you for the journey that you're on the journey of not wanting to be abusive. And let's talk about this. So there's a couple of things that you mentioned. One of them was you get mad or you have a temper when you are trying to get your point across and trying to communicate, but she's invalidating and she's making you feel a certain way or she's saying things that are causing some sort of emotional response in you. And that temper builds up and you get to that, again, to that survival mode where you just go into fight or flight and then you suddenly lose it. I'm not going to give you a free pass on that one. <laughs> I'm not. At the same time, I completely understand and I can totally relate. I think a lot of us can. So you don't get the free pass. <laughs> you don't get to call her names and losing your temper, you know, it can happen to the best of us. We all can lose our temper. If I drop a hammer on my toe, I'm losing my damn temper. It's going to happen. And I might yell things and say things. However, now we have a situation where you are feeling backed against the wall. So let's talk about the other side of this. You're feeling backed against the wall. You didn't get that first validation that you needed. So now you can't even talk about that anymore because she quickly dismissed it. And you get to the point where you simply can't convey what you need to convey because she is diverting the conversation to either suit her needs or whatever she thinks is more important, whatever it is. You know, I'm making some guesses here and I'm making some interpretations and I'm not telling you you're more right or she's more right. 
this is something that I don't have any experience with YouTube. So again, I'm making some guesses. So just bear with me as I try to interpret this stuff. But the reason I'm not giving you a free pass is because, yes, if you start calling somebody else names, then it does become reciprocal emotional abuse. It does become verbal abuse. It does become part of the abuse cycle that often happens. If you've heard my show where I talk about the abuser abuses the victim, the victim has to become abusive back, not only to be heard, but also get their needs met. This is probably what's happening to you. There's a point where you get where she's crossed the line because she's not listening to you. So you have to become verbally or emotionally or psychologically abusive back. And now she's focused on that as you being the abuser because she may have dismissed all that stuff in the beginning as not being abusive. What you need to do and what you may not be able to do, maybe you won't reconnect. I don't know if you're going to get back together or not, but I think you're onto something that the very first step when you start talking about this stuff is your feelings being invalidated. If you don't discuss that, then it falls apart. And so I think it's important that you say, we need to talk about this first. I can't go further with this until we talk about this. What you said made me feel this way. Now she may say, I can't make you feel anything. That's in you. She may say that, and other people may say that. Other people listening to this right now may believe that. I believe it's true, and I also believe that other people can make you feel a certain way. Other people have a way to do that. It's very manipulative, and a lot of them don't even know they're doing it. Some people just believe that everyone has their own emotions that they deal with inside themselves, and there's no way that somebody else can make anyone feel a certain way. I disagree. I think you can make someone feel a certain way People can make you feel a certain way. You don't want to feel that way. So it's not like you're doing it to yourself. I don't want to feel invalidated. I don't want to feel unloved or disrespected, but this is how I feel. Your feelings are valid. They are real. Remember that. My feelings are valid. They are real. So remember that when the communication starts, whether it's an argument or just a heated conversation, when it starts, you have to address each and every item that comes up. And this is probably one of the main points I want you to remember in this episode is that instead of glossing over things and moving past them to get to the next topic to talk about, when you have someone that's willing to work with you and improve the communication between you, that you do not gloss over or generalize anything. Because there's a big difference in saying to someone something like this, I hate it when you yell at me. It makes me feel unloved and hurt. That is a very personal thing. And saying that as opposed to saying, I hate it when you yell. There's a big difference there. The first one is very specific. You're not glossing over it. You're not generalizing it. You are bringing up a specific detail and how it makes you feel. If you say, I hate it when you yell then what you're doing is saying every time this person yells, whether they're yelling at me or not, and I know you didn't mean that, but let's just say that this is how it's interpreted. Every time you yell, whether it's toward me or not, is bad. And it's uh, hurtful to me. Every time you raise your voice, every time you scream at the TV, it's hurtful to me. That's what a generalization is. You're just saying doesn't matter when you yell, it's a bad thing. This is why it's important to be very specific as opposed to very generic. You both may know what you're talking about, but in order to talk about that stuff and not skip over to the next subject, you have to break it down and say, no, this is what we need to talk about. When you yell at me, it hurts me. It feels like you don't love me. It feels like you're disrespecting me. I don't like that. I don't feel like your wife. I feel like a little child being disciplined and I don't like that feeling. I want to be in an equal relationship with someone who can talk about things, not yell at me when things happen. That may not go well with certain people. You may get someone respond, well, I wouldn't have to yell at you if fill in the blank. But you want to be able to stop the conversation and talk about that very specific thing and not gloss over it. Glossing over is, I hate it when you yell at me. Well, I hate it when you do this. What? When I do that, what are you talking about? And suddenly you're on a different topic. 
suddenly you've gone past what might be the most important point, and once you've passed that point, there's probably no return. Because what are you going to say? Well, let's go back to that yelling thing. You can say that, but you may be so beyond that in another frame of mind that it's hard to get back to that. So this is vital when you are having any type of heated debate or conversation or you know the argument starting is the first thing that comes up, just like this person did, he broke it down, he analyzed it and figured out, huh, it starts to go bad when she invalidates my feelings. And I'm not saying that he's right and she's wrong. I don't know. This is his analysis. But let's just take at face value what he wrote and say, okay, let's just say that's what happens. She invalidates his feelings. Well, this puts him in a space. We need to focus on that space. Honey, I'm in this space. You probably won't call her honey at that moment, but I'm in this space when you do that. When you say this thing, I'm in this space. I feel sad. I feel hurt. I feel disrespected. I feel unloved. I feel unworthy. And she may go, well, you shouldn't feel that. Well, I do. This is what I feel. And her next question is, why do you feel that? I would hope that would be her next question. If this is something that you're going to work on together, that should be your next question. Why do you feel that? I mean, it can still be in that heated space. Well, why do you feel that way? It can be said that way, sure. But at least you're addressing it. If you skip past it, this is where things can fall apart. This is something you want to keep in mind when an argument starts, when a conversation might have an opportunity to go the wrong way, is focusing on the component that comes up. And you have to do this in you. You have to figure out, did that just get glossed over? And if it did, I need to bring it back. That's what you have to do. You have to keep it in your own mind. They have to keep theirs in their mind, and you have to keep the conversation in your mind to figure out if the subject that you just brought up got glossed over because you're not going to be able to address or fix anything if you gloss over things because when you gloss over things, his invalidation of his feelings, for example, they never get resolved and they will always be a point of stress and hurt and anger or sadness or whatever it is inside of him always every time and that gets carried over into every next argument and if you're with someone who has the ability to dismiss what you're carrying over then you'll never feel a resolve you'll never get a resolve you'll never close the loop on the emotional stuff that you're holding on to it'll just always be there if you want to know what crazy making feels like, that is somewhat on the outskirts of defining what that's like. There's always some sort of unresolved thing going on. And I mean, crazy making is much bigger than that, but that is part of it. You just feel so unresolved all the time. Like you just can't reach a resolution because it was never resolved before. Now, you may have had a conversation about something that did get resolved, but what component was unresolved in that conversation? And that's where you might have to do what this person did, start breaking down exactly the point the important stuff got glossed over. I'm not saying you have to record your conversations. If you do, you have to do that with consent and you know certain states have laws. But if you want to do that, you know certainly talk about that with the person that you're with. And if that's agreeable, then you can figure it out. I mean, hopefully you have someone you can figure things out together. The people that listen to this show, some do have those partners that will work together and some don't. Some people have partners or other people in their life that just want to be right. They just want to control. They just want to manipulate. They just want to make sure they're always in power and make sure that you don't have power. If somebody's taking away your power, making you feel bad, making you feel down on yourself, making you feel unworthy, unloved, all of that is part of emotional abuse. And I don't want you to be in that space which is why I give you tools like this, making sure you don't let the other person gloss over. And if they do gloss over, you bring them back. It's very, very similar to something I talked about in another episode, which is the question that you ask the person, do you realize what you just said hurt me? Because if they don't realize it, then you can bring them back to it and then you can have a talk about it. If they do realize it, then you have another issue. Yeah, I realize I hurt you oh, uh, wow, what do you do with that? And that might be another direction you have to take in your life and your, th your thought process and 
and doing things with that. But I talk about that in another show. It's I think it's an effective question. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work with certain people. In fact, I just heard recently that somebody tried that and they said, well, what you do hurt me. So that happens. You're going to get these rebuttals. And I always come back with the answer to that, which is, okay, you might be right about that. Or this is your experience. So I, I absolutely think we need to talk about that too. So let's go in order and talk about what I just said first. And then we'll talk about what you just said. I make that sound so easy. <laughs> I know, and I'm so sorry, because sometimes this isn't easy. Often, it's not easy. And in the heat of the moment, you're like, oh, I'm going to remember this question, and when can I throw that question in? You know, this is one step at a time. Remember one thing from this episode, listen to it again, and remember another thing from this episode, and then take it with you into the next conversation, and maybe you'll have a more productive conversation. Or maybe you'll discover that there's absolutely no way to have a productive conversation, in which case you may not be able to get what you want from the relationship. And for this person who wrote to me, he may not, you may not be able to get what you want from this relationship. She may be apart from you and she may never be able to get past herself and the way she thinks and what she believes about you. And you just have to support her path no matter where you go with this because what's most important is that she sees that you're supporting her no matter what direction she takes, which shows her that you do not want to control her. You do not want to coerce her. You don't want to convince her of anything. And as much as it hurts, if she doesn't want the relationship anymore, you're going to support it anyway. That's easy for me to say. It's very hard to do. I wasn't able to do it in my past, but I'm able to think that way and do this today because I've realized I would rather be with someone who absolutely, without a doubt, wants to be with me without question, without fear, feeling completely secure and trusting in the relationship than be with someone who has all these doubts and has all these fears and thinks that I'm abusive and just isn't sure about me. I don't want that at all. I don't want that at all. And I don't want you to feel like you have to be in a relationship with somebody like that who is constantly making you walk on eggshells or making you think that you're wrong or abusive you deserve respect and kindness. You deserve someone who sees you for who you are, not someone that you have to convince them who you are. If you have to convince them that you're better, you're not abusive or any of that stuff, then they may always have doubt. That may always be in there. They have to come to that conclusion on their own. This is why that saying sometimes often works. If you love someone, set them free. If they come back, then it'll probably stick. If they don't, then they still have those doubts and those fears and those insecurities. And if they have those, they'll creep into the relationship and then they'll come out in different ways and you'll have what you had. I'm not saying you won't get back into this relationship. There's a good chance you might. There's a great chance that you might because she hasn't closed the door. But it's just important for you to give her that space, which you're doing, which is amazing. And also let her know, you know what? I do lose my temper. It's true. I do lose my temper. And I'm working on that. Instead of saying, you know, I lose my temper because you do this to me. We're practicing some non-volatile communication here. I lose my temper and it's true. And I need to work on that. You do need to work on that. You have a right to lose your temper. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just saying that when you focus on these specific issues without glossing over, then the temper buildup doesn't happen. But if you're never able to convince her to go back to that topic and talk about that first topic, then you're probably going to feel like you've lost. You're going to feel that lingering effect, that unresolved feeling, and you're going to bring it with you to the end of the argument where you finally lose your temper because you just can't get your point across, which means the buildup is happening. You have to catch the buildup. And that buildup is probably based on that first invalidation. So as soon as you feel that happening, you have to step back. You have to step back and say, you know what? This is when my temper builds. It's happening right now. I mean, you can do this. If you have a conversation with her again and you feel that temper building, you can say, whoa, it's happening right now. My temper is building. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Now, maybe she'll say, your temper shouldn't be building. This isn't a big deal. And if that's the case, if you can't even talk about that because you're being vulnerable when you say my temper is building, then you may not be able to have healthy communication with her. 
she has to come to that realization that she has to stop on those specific topics and discuss those specific items so that you can make the next stepping stone to talk about the next thing that hopefully can get to a better place with all of this so that it doesn't go into the temper and the name calling and all of that. Because if you're reaching that over and over again, then you are not catching yourself in that temper. You are not telling her, I'm having this build up, we need to stop, and you haven't addressed the first thing that was glossed over. And if you can't get it back to that first thing, you might have to exit the argument. You might just have to say, you know what, this is going to build into my temper because we never talked about this first thing. If you're not willing to talk about this first thing, then I don't know how else to convey to you how I keep losing my temper. You just may have to get to that point. And she still may not understand and she still may just think it's all you. And if that's the case, do you really want to be with someone who's just blaming you all the time and putting you on the spot and making you think that you're the bad person this is your choice. This is your call, of course. And maybe all of this work that you're doing and all this uh, space that she has to reflect and think about things, give it at least two months. Four is even better. You can still start connecting after two months. Maybe you can go on a date night. Maybe you can talk about things, but give her that space because that might be the best hope for reconciling. And I do wish you the best in this. I wish you much strength. And uh, thank you again for writing, and I appreciate your words about the show. And if you know anyone that can benefit from this episode, share this with others that might benefit. Love and Abuse is the official podcast of The Meaning Workbook, an assessment and healing guide for difficult relationships containing a 200-point checklist to help you not only pinpoint the exact behaviors causing the difficulties in your relationship, but also clearly reveal to you why you leave so many interactions feeling bad. The workbook will help you make the next best relationship decisions for both of you. Use it to understand your own behaviors and how they affect those you love, or use it together to reveal issues that you both need to work on. Visit loveandabuse.com for more information. This show exists to remind you that you are not alone and you're not going crazy. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. You deserve honesty and sincerity. You deserve to be treated as worthy and significant because you are. Thanks for joining me. We'll talk again soon.